Now let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength, my redeemer, this is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought those men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not you serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if you be ready that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sack, you fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if you worship not, you shall be cast into the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands. Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this manner. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And my message today is, we won't serve your God. We won't serve your God. Now these were words that were spoken by three men who were doomed to a fiery furnace because they refuse to compromise their beliefs. They believe that the God they serve was the creator of the universe and the one that was concerned about them. They believe that there is no material good enough to make an image of him. And when someone makes an image and call it a god, they would not worship it, even if their life depended on it. Now, the background for this scenario is uh, Shed, Mac, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel were enslaved in Babylon. And the king had a dream. And as a result of his dream, it was Daniel that was able to interpret the dream to the satisfaction of the king. And the king promoted Daniel to a high position next to him to rule the country. And the three fellows, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were given positions also. And they were doing their job there were some individuals that were very close to the king and they were very jealous of these four men, uh, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were very jealous because they were Jews and they had a different tradition than the Babylonians. So they got to the king and encouraged the king to uh, build this golden idol and to order all of the provinces to bow down when the signal was given and worship the golden idol. These enemies to the Jews knew that whenever the king made an edit, gave an order, it was, it was irrefutable and it could not be changed. And so they uh, had the king to uh, make the decree knowing that these individuals, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, would not bow down. Daniel was nowhere to be seen 
so he was not in the picture. The king ordered that everybody was to bow down when they heard the musicians play. And these individuals, Shadrach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, did not bow down. They were caught up in their tradition, and they would not bow down. And as a result of that, the king was alerted, and he saw them. And he brought them to his chambers and said to them that either you bow down or you will go into the fiery fires, the fiery furnace. And they said to him, King, our God will protect us. Amen. And even if he does, we're not going to bow down to you. And you know the rest of the story. But the thing about these three uh, young men, they looked at that idol as something they could not relate to nor communicate with. And they talked of their God as he, not it. The God of the Babylonians they referred to as it, but their God they referred to it as he. My God, they wanted to let you know that they had a personal relationship with their God. Yeah. The idea personal is not to be, is to be different. The idea personal is to be differentiated from a thing in one way, in only one way. That way is communication. Yeah. This personalization of your God as he, or a pronoun for your God being real, your God being alive, they understood that because they realized you can't communicate with a thing. One cannot communicate with an idol. Amen. An idol is a thing. Yes. And, and you can't relate to that as having a personal relationship with it, with you, because anything you have a personal relationship with you, there's a form of communication. Amen. You may have a strong relationship with your automobile, but it can never be personal. Because it's one-sided. That, that, that car don't know you. And so it is with the idol. The idol don't know you. So you cannot communicate with it in a personal way. For God to be personal simply means that one thinks of God as one thinks of a person. It means that we think in terms of being able to communicate with him. And Jesus taught us that. You, you know, in the model prayer, Jesus tells us to begin our prayer with our Father. Yeah. You're identifying yourself and your relationship to the one you are identifying with. My heavenly Father, yes. the creator of all things. When we are identifying ourselves when we pray, we are praying to a person as one talks to a person. And in many ways, God does talk to us. Knowing God in a personal relationship was what Jesus was talking about when he said, no man cometh to the Father but by me. That's why it is so important when you pray, in conclusion to your prayer, you say, in the name of Jesus, this is my prayer. 
Because no prayer gets to the Heavenly Father unless it's filtered through Jesus. So we have this understanding and we have this personal relationship by believing and committing ourselves to Jesus we know he will show the Father as we know Jesus as a person we get to know God in somewhat of the same manner the problem with so many people so many people, they're religious people, and they're churchgoers, but so many people don't know Jesus in a personal way. They know of him, but they don't know him. These uh, uh, three fellows, they knew God in a personal way because they said he's concerned about us. He will protect us. If you throw us in a fiery furnace, we don't care. We know he's concerned about us and he's going to do what is needed to protect us, to let us know that he's concerned about us. Amen. Well, we have a personal relationship with God through Jesus. Sometimes we are confronted with things we just don't understand. But because we have that relationship, we say, I know that I know that I know. I can't explain it, but I know God is still in control. And since I know, I'm anchoring myself in what I know. That's having a personal relationship. God was real to those three condemned men because they had cultivated their relationship through prayer. There's no better way to learn about a person than to talk to them. Amen. You learn about a person when you learn to talk to them, having conversations with them. That is why uh, in our social relationship in the family, there's a breakdown because there's no communication. There was a time when families used to have meal time together. And everybody know that at such and such a time, it's meal time. And everybody came and sat around the table. And at the table, we shared conversation. We, we, we just uh, 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 communicated one with another. Now everybody have their own time to eat. The food is in the refrigerator and we got the microwave. So whenever we want to eat, we just go heat up the food, sit down and eat. Everybody's on the go. We don't have time to relate one with another. The only way you can get to commute, know a person is to learn how to communicate with that individual. Sit down and talk to him. All times you hear me talk about my relationship with my father. I learned a lot just by sitting down, talking to him, listening to his view of the poet. And it found itself in my spirit in such a way that he's always close to me. We need to go back to the old landmarks and learn how to communicate one with another. This is the problem in many relationships uh, uh, between husband and wife uh, we don't communicate. And the first thing you say, they don't understand me. They don't understand because you never try to learn uh, each other. You never try to communicate and connect one with the other. These three Hebrew boys, they connected with God. Yes. They knew that God knew them because they knew God and they knew God because God knew them. There was a relationship. And the way they got that relationship was with God was they learned how to pray. They knew how to pray. Amen. Now these three men served their God regardless of what happened. They weren't concerned about what was going on around them. They were going to serve their God anyway. Yeah. This was highly unusual. Because in biblical times, people believed that their God 
kept them successful. And whenever things were not going their way, they would change gods. What it happens then, it happens now, don't it? People are changing their gods. And, uh, and, and they're going, why? Because they want success. And let's let a little secret out. We want success, every one of us. We want to be blessed, every one of us. We want to have a, a, a better time, every one of us. And, and, and in biblical times, and even now, uh, those individuals uh, uh, believe that their God was to make them successful, and if it didn't, uh, they would change God. Nothing has changed. There are many people today that have the same idea about God. They believe that once they make the commitment to serve God through Jesus, they become immune to trouble, immune to heartache, immune to pain, immune to suffering, and all of the other foibles of life. But let me correct you there. When you become a child of God, it doesn't make you immune to those things. It makes you more vulnerable to those things. Why? Because the enemy is angry at you and he's going to throw all the fiery darts at you. But if you have a connection, you recognize that my God is able to keep me even in the fiery furnace. Though the fiery darts of hell are tossed at me, I have a shield, I have a breastplate yes, to shield me from those fiery darts. Those individuals that don't know that, when trouble comes their way, they go to pieces. They are the persons who use prayer not as the way of confidence that all will be well because God is present, but instead they require a miracle as proof of God's presence. We see the evidence all around us. We want God to prove that he hears us, to prove that he knows about us. We want God to prove to us who he is. It should be just the opposite. We should let God know that we have confidence in who he is and act like we know who he is. We look around us and we see those individuals that are defeated because they become prisoners of fear. They are bound by the circumstances surrounding them. They can't sleep at night because they're worried about the social circumstances around them in D.C. There's craziness all around us shooting and all the other crazy stuff. Then you read the newspapers and you see on TV all the crazy stuff that's going on around in the world. Floods and famines and, 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 and all of the other things. Hurricanes, all of the bad stuff and the child of God can't sleep at night worrying about that stuff. Well, if you're anchored in the Lord, you ought to be concerned but you ought to be concerned enough to know that God is still in charge. Yes, and we have a responsibility to do whatever we can, but the rest, turn it over to the Lord and roll over and sleep real good. That's what you do when you know the Lord. That's what you do when you know the Lord. Uh, uh, that's why that songwriter said, there are some things I may not know. There are some places I cannot go. But there's one thing I am sure, that God is real. Not because I read about it, that God is real. Not because somebody told me about it, God is real. How do I know I can feel him in my soul? And when you, and when you know God is real, then you can walk with confidence. Those three boys and the three men in the 
fiery furnace. They knew God was real. They said, oh, our God is able. Our God is able. Our God is able. Those three men had the confidence to know that they were free even though they were in jail. They knew that they were delivered to a furnace that had been heated seven times hotter just for them. The king wanted to make sure they became ashes. So he heated it up seven times higher. That furnace was so high that the men that, that were stoked in the fire got close to it and it consumed them. But they had, those three men had confidence in their God. To the God that they served, they had confidence that they could say to the king, we won't serve your God. Amen. Heat up the furnace. You heated it seven times, heat it up 15 times. We don't care That's all right. how God is able. Yes, I want you to know that is the evidence of your confidence in your relationship with God. Your statement would be like this. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from this burning, fiery furnace. And he not only will deliver us out of the furnace, he'll deliver us from your hand, okay? The king tossed them in the fiery furnace. And all of a sudden, the king became very concerned because their confidence caused him to be concerned. Yes. These men are getting ready to be tossed to the fiery furnace. These men are going to be cons consumed by a fiery furnace just because they didn't bow down to my God and they had the nerve to say to me, the king, my God is able Amen. to take care of us. Yes. Now our God is able to protect us from you, O oh king. Bible tells of King Nebuchadnezzar. He became so concerned. He became so concerned that he, uh, after ordering those men to death, he decided to go and see what was going on. The Bible tells us that King Nebuchadnezzar came to see the spectacle, to see the fire consumed these three men who had the audacity to defy his order. Had the, the audacity to confront him and say, we don't care, king. Do what you want to do to us. We're going to serve our God. Amen. The Bible tells us the king came to the furnace and looked in and he stepped back. And he said to someone, didn't I put in three to be burned? Yes, sir. And I see four. And they're not burning, they're dancing, they're shouting. They're doing a, a dance in the fiery furnace. Something is wrong. There's three I put in, but there's another one that looks like the Son of God. I tell you. Yes, I tell you something is going on. Yes, then the king ordered that those men be released from the furnace. Interesting thing about it, when they were released, when they got out of that furnace, they weren't singed, the clothes weren't burned, everything about them was intact. And the king was so impressed that he made a decree, he said, listen, I'm declaring that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego ought to be able to do whatever they want to do. And if anybody criticized them, or talk against their God, I'm going to personally see that they receive punishment in a fiery furnace. Not only that, Nebuchadnezzar was so impressed with them that he restored them to wholeness and gave them his complete confidence. I want you to understand something, folk. 
than when you don't serve their God and you anchor yourself in your God, the God that you know, that'll be with you in time of need. He said, I'll be your friend when you're friendless. I'll be your doctor in the operating room. I'll be your lawyer in the courthouse. I'll be there to provide your needs. And you can declare unto him, that is the God I serve. And I don't care what you have to say. I don't care what you try to do. I'm going to serve him even though you threaten me with a fiery furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth because they made the declaration. We will not serve your God. Amen. Amen. Let us all stand. This is altar call. Come on down to the altar. Come on down to the altar. Come on down to the altar. Come on down. And as you come, come with expectancy. Come prepared to lay at the altar. All of us heavy weights, all of those cares, all of those frustrations, all of those needs that you've been carrying all week. Come on down, prepared to deposit them at the altar and allow the flowing healing stream of God's eternal brook consume them. God's eternal river consume them and that they are consumed in such a way that they will never rise to trouble his children again. Let us pray. Eternal and merciful Father, the invitation was extended. And the invitation was bring your burden to the Lord. Bring your burden to the altar and leave it there. Lord, you gave us the authority to operate because you gave the invitation. For your word teaches us we ask anything in your name yes. and believe in our hearts it shall be given unto us. Yes. And your word taught us and it's engrafted in our spirit yes. that it is your desire that we prosper and be in good health even as our soul also prospers. Yes. It is your desire that we have all the things that we need. For your word has taught us we are to be the lender, not the borrower. We're supposed to be the leaders, not the followers. We're supposed to set the example. Yes. And Lord, we know when we are not meeting those criteria, it's a challenge. But you gave us the solution to the challenge because you said if we ask anything according to your word, you will give it. And your word has taught us no good thing will you withhold from them that diligently seek you and walketh upright. And Lord, we fit the criteria. And that's why we are here at the altar saying, Lord, I deposit all of those things that I shouldn't have. The things that separated me from joy and peace of mind. The things that are separating me from prosperity and a hopeful spirit, the things that are blocking me from the salvation that you have for me, the righteousness that you have for me. Lord, I'm tired of being a prisoner, tired of being a prisoner to sin, and I'm asking, Lord, break these shackles so that I can sing the heavenly praise. Eternal merciful Father, we thank you for hearing our prayer. In the name of Jesus, with gratitude, we say amen. amen. Let us stand. Now, Lord, as we leave this place, we pray that the sweet fellowship of the Holy Communion will rest, rule, and abide within our hearts 
now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Please be seated for moments of reflection.